So let's just get to the Word of God, because that's what we're here for today. Have you guys ever known someone who you've known them for a long time, and then just suddenly it's like they, they're a completely different person? We all know one person. You can We don't need to show hands, but on Facebook, they're just this family person. They're always posting about their kids' soccer games, and then next thing you know, they're trying to sell you Rodan and Fields, and they're trying to get you to join their pyramid scheme. And you're like, I thought that this is not who you were yesterday. Next thing you know, they're going back this way. Or if it was me, like if suddenly I started just talking about fitness instead of donuts and cake, you'd be like, what got into John recently? And I'm just like out running and stuff. You'd, you'd think there's something wrong. We all know someone like that. And it's, it's as if they were just running in a certain direction and they hit a wall and they're going the completely other direction. And we're going to see that in a sense today in, in our passage in Acts chapter 2 because we're going to hear the first sermon ever preached and it was by Pastor Peter. That's what we're going to refer to him as today. But we all, we all know the story of Peter. He was the gung-ho disciple who, who if Jesus said jump, he was like, how far? And you know, Jesus walked on water and then Peter's like, I want to come out. And so he goes out on the water and then he starts to doubt and sink. Or Peter, when they came to crucify Jesus, he's the one that whipped out his sword and cut their ear off. And Jesus is like, Peter, no, like heals the ear. But then we all know that Peter couldn't even withstand the test of a little servant girl. And he denied Jesus three times. And that only happened 50 days prior to what we're going to study today. 50 days before Peter was denying Jesus. And today we're going to see him rise up against all of the devout Jewish men who were gathered in Jerusalem. And we'll look at the, just how big of a crowd that was. So if you will, turn over to Acts chapter 2 with me. And it is quite a lengthy section, so I'm only going to read the first part before we pray. It says in verse 14, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful for your word. And like Marcus said, I'm so grateful it's your word and not mine because your word is perfect. It's without blame. It's, it's without void. It, it has the power to change lives, God. And I'm just so grateful we can study it. Speak through me this morning, be glorified, open our minds and our hearts to receive your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I just want to give a little recap. We've, we've been going through the first two chapters of Acts, and that is by design. I've taught youth ministry before. I've, I've been a chapel director for a Christian school before, but I've never been a pastor before. And you know, like with most, most babies you bring home, you go, this didn't come with an owner's manual. I've looked through Wayne's office. There was no owner's manual for the church. So as we, as we move forward, I've been seeking counsel from other wise pastors in town. And all I was told is just preach the word. Don't start doing these wild outreaches and events. Just preach the word. And I was told to start in Acts chapters 1 and 2. That's why we're going through them, if you're wondering. Because this is how the church was born this is how the church should function and how it was started. And so this is the, the user's manual, the order of operations, so to speak. So we're going to finish out chapter two next week, and then I'll present a little vision for the future. But what we've seen in chapter one is we saw Jesus in his final 40 days on earth with the apostles, teaching them. We saw that he appeared many different times. And after he had died, the apostles kind of lost faith. They went into hiding because they're like, oh no. The guy we were following is dead. We're certainly dead next. And so they went into hiding. And next thing you know, Jesus 
raises up from the dead, walks through walls and appears to them, walks with them, eats with them and shows them, hey, I'm the real deal. I am the Messiah. And so their faith is ignited. They're all about it. They're sold out. Remember, they were hyped. They just wanted to go. And Jesus like, no, 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 wait. The Holy Spirit's going to come. So we saw them return to the upper room. And then we looked at their gathering. They gathered together. They were studying the word. They were praying. They were going in and out of town to worship. It was all about the Lord. And we looked at how their gathering was structured. Then last week, we saw the coming of the Holy Spirit, that infamous day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit baptized the church for the first time. And we talked about how as believers, when we give our lives to the Lord and put our trust in faith, we receive that baptism. It's a one-time sealed deal. And then for the rest of our walks, we're encouraged to be filled with that spirit that we've already received. Today, we're going to look at the first sermon ever preached. And aside from all of Jesus's teachings, this is probably the greatest sermon ever teach, second to Jesus. And I started with the history of Peter because if you think about it, 50 days before this, Peter was denying Jesus to a lowly servant girl. It would have been like when Emma or Aubrey were little kids, if they came in and I just like completely denied and like, no, no, don't hurt me, please. That's, that's what I vision in my head. And now 50 days later, Peter is going to address these mass quantities of people. It was more than 3,000 people. I know that because they give the specific amount that he says at the end of chapter two, there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So that means from this massive group of people, 3,000 of them give their lives to the Lord. So Peter, who 50 days prior was denying Jesus, is now standing up and defending Jesus to this mass amount of people. That's only a result of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. And when the Holy Spirit indwells us, remember, we looked at the fact that, that Jesus equipped us. He taught, he taught the apostles. He gave them everything that they knew. And he said, wait for the Spirit because they were equipped and that Spirit came in and empowered them to go. And now this is, we're going to see a tangible look at what the Holy Spirit empowerment looks like. So Peter begins his sermon here by addressing the question that they asked in verse 13, uh, verse 12, where he, when they say, what does this mean? And then others in the group were saying they're filled with new wine. And, and Peter, standing there with the 11, lifted up his voice. So remember, they're all in the upper room. They're all filled with the Spirit. Everyone from Jerusalem comes to see, what is that noise? What was that noise? And so they're in the upper room and they're looking. I get this idea that they're kind of out looking what does this mean? Are they, they must be drunk. That's the conclusion that the, the Jewish people came to. And so Peter standing there lifted up his voice or to make it more understandable, it could be translated. He raises his voice. He says, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give ear to my words. Peter saying, hey, you guys, listen up. We're not drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning. That's what the third hour means, if you're wondering. It's nine o'clock in the morning. It's not even, not even the, the town drunks are drunk right now. They're still waking up. And, and on top of that, it's, it's, it's the Pentecost feast. We don't drink until there's food served. So why are you, are you even accusing us of this? I, I mean, we even think about modern culture. If you drive through Santa Clarita in the morning, the the people who unfortunately are homeless they're not drunk at seven in the morning nine in the morning they're just waking up packing up it, it didn't change in bible time so peter why would you think we're drunk it's nine in the morning and what peter's going to do is he's going to turn their eyes back to scripture because remember what we looked at last week the the jewish people who were in jerusalem at the time they're described as devout jews so this means they knew scripture they studied it I mean, for goodness sake, they made the trek all the way to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. They were sold out for the, the scripture. And so Peter says here in verse 16, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And then he goes on to recite to them Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. What he's saying is that, hey, this that was prophesied then. This is happening now. And this is really cool for us, church of 2022. What Joel prophesied before Jesus was even born, the apostles are living it out here. 
but you and I are living it out right now because it talks about, and in the last days it shall be. We're in the last days. Now, now I'm not going revelation conspiracy theorists, but from the minute Jesus ascended, the timer on the last days started. And now we're 2022 years into the last days. We don't know where they're going to end, but they're going to end when he comes back. So we are fulfilling this prophecy as we speak. He says, in the last days it shall be, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on Santa Clarita and people, on Pasadena, on Los Angeles, on anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. That's what we're seeing happen here. And he's reminding them, we're not drunk. This shouldn't be a surprise. You studied this. You devoted your life to this. I think that's pretty cool that we're fulfilling this prophecy. You guys can join me. Like, are we, do you think that's cool? Okay. So the first thing I want to look at this morning in Pastor Pete's sermon is, is good preaching is based in scripture. The first thing he does here is point their attention to the scripture. He, he could have said, hey guys, listen up. We were in this room and we were praying and, and, and Mary was about to serve oatmeal. Next thing you know, whoosh, this wind comes in. But no, no, he goes, listen up. You knew about this. And he goes straight to scripture and quotes by memory, might I add, Joel chapter two. He quotes the whole passage. Marcus said for us earlier, the mission statement of Gateway Bible Church, but we believe here that the word of God has the power to change lives one verse at a time. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word has power. There's, when it says that it, it's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, it pierces to the heart. It pierces to the soul with conviction and life change. And when you read it, as it says in Isaiah, it never returns void. If I was to go and read the Bible to a sold out stadium at COC, there's gonna be people there that, that receive life from the scripture that have their eyes open because the word of God never returns void. And that's why here at Gateway Bible Church, we will always preach the gospel. We will always preach the word one verse at a time because I, John, Augusta, will fail with my words but God's word will never fail. And this isn't just something that we came up with to put on the window, to put on our website. Peter here knows it. He stands up and immediately returns their minds to scripture. And he goes to Joel. He reads it and he says, it was prophesied to you. This shouldn't be a surprise. Many pastors today and many pastors this morning all across this country had really cool worship with lasers and fog machines, which if we get some fog machines in here, I'm not going to complain. That's not part of the vision. Don't worry. Um, but they, they have these, they show up in their skinny jeans and their Air Jordans. They get up. Most of them just kind of carry their Bible like this and never open it. And they give you a quick 20 minute encouragement. You walk out, you're like, wow, what's for lunch today? What are we going to do? Wow. Want to go to a 4th of July party? And that's, that's church. But that's not what we see Peter here. He stands up and he's very long-winded in what he says. He quotes Joel chapter 2, but then later in verse 25, he's going to quote Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. And then in verse 34, he's going to quote Psalm 110, verse 1. Every single thing he does is he brings their attention back to the scriptures that they knew. 50 days prior, he was denying Jesus. And now he's standing up to these mass crowds of devout Jewish leaders proclaiming scripture to them. That's what the Holy Spirit does, brothers and sisters. I've said it so many times, and I'm going to say it again. When we read scripture, we need to meditate on it. We need to memorize scripture. First Peter he later on writes this in his own book in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 15. He says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, 
always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Or in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Paul encourages young Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Always be ready. Gateway Bible Church, are you guys ready? If, if you're out in the town and someone asks, wow, why are, why are you so happy? Why are you smiling? Are you like, oh, I just won $20 on the California lottery? Or are you ready to, to share the gospel? Are you ready to talk about the death and resurrection of Jesus? Is the scripture in you? Is it, are you saturated enough with scripture where if 5,000 Jewish people come up, you can just stand up and preach because that's what we're called to do. Be ready in season and out. Maybe it's not to get up and preach, but you should always be ready to tell someone about Jesus. And we see that here, that despite his shaky resume, when the Holy Spirit empowered Peter, everything that he studied and learned from Jesus was ready to go. And scripture is what came out of him. God's word flowed out of Peter because when he was pressed, what he had been filling himself with is what came out. And so Gateway Bible Church, we need to be saturated and grounded in scripture. The second thing we're going to see here in Pastor Peter's sermon is the message. We, we see that his message, his sermon was grounded in scripture, but now let's see what is he using the scripture to convey. Look at verse 22 with me. He says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourself know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then he goes back to scripture for David says concerning him, and this is from Psalm 16, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced and my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. He says, men, this Jesus, which you crucified. And, and, he, and remember, in Jewish culture, they're all about the Messiah. I, I heard it said by J. Vernon McGee that he met with a really devout, established rabbi and he referred to Jesus as the Messiah and he said that the rabbi stood up from behind his desk and said, don't say that because they killed the Messiah. And, and Peter reminds him, this isn't just some guy. He refers to him as Jesus of Nazareth because that was what Jesus was referred to here on earth, which was a humbling name. He could have been referred to Jesus, the son of God, Jesus the Christ, the savior, but he was 100% man. And so in order to kind of downplay him, the religious leaders called him, oh, that's Jesus of Nazareth. And so Peter reminds him, he says, this Jesus of Nazareth was attested to you by God. That means, hey, God showed you through many signs and many wonders that, that this was the Messiah. Let me just read you real quick from Matthew chapter 11. In verses 1 to 6, it says, When Jesus had finished instructing the twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus says, go and tell him about the signs and wonders. If you need more proof, you could write this down. That was Matthew 11, 1 through 6. It goes on again in Luke 7, verses 20 through 22. And then I'm just going to read to you Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. 
in which it says in verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So, so Jewish men, God made it known to you that this Jesus of Nazareth, who you crucified, who you killed, but then Peter's very good with his words here. He says, killed and killed by the hands of lawless men because if he would have just said you crucified him, the, the Jews would have been, well, the, the Romans did it too. So he throws in lawless men there too so that the, the Romans know that they're not off the hook. But he says, this was the Messiah. This was the Savior. And I love this next part. Look at verse 20, um, 23. This is so good. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. <laughs> when you read through the crucifixion story in all the Gospels, Jesus is literally orchestrating it all as it happens. He turns himself in. He's telling them, like, didn't do what you came to do. Never once are they in control. And it says here, he delivered himself up according to the sovereignty of God, according to the foreknowledge. So it's like, hey, you guys killed him, but you were never in control one time. He then brings their attention back to Psalm 16, and that, that's really good for me because it helps me understand Psalm 16. So not only is this the first sermon, it's also the first um, study Bible. It's the, it's the Peter study Bible. But what we see in Psalm 16 here is this is actually Jesus speaking pro prophetically through David in the Psalms. And so the Jewish people would have thought, oh, this is, this is David speaking. But what we know now looking back is this was Jesus prophetically speaking through David. And it's another reminder that the Messiah would conquer death and would rise again. He goes on, and if you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 29, Peter says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So J. Vernon McGee in his commentary, he said that when he stood at this place where Peter's preaching this message, he was able to point to the grave of David, the tomb where David was buried. So I get this idea that, that Peter's saying, brothers, I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and he's, he's still with us to this day. So Psalm 16 can't be talking about him. It could only be talking about Jesus because death could not hold him. Psalm 110 verse 1 is another reminder where he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. David didn't ascend into heaven. He's still buried right here. The Lord ascended and is now sitting at the right hand of God. That is who these scriptures that you studied, Jewish men, that you claim to know, Jewish men, that's what these are about. And God made it known to you that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah and you crucified him. But guess what? Jesus could not be held by death. God loosed the pangs of death and he rose again and is now living and reigning in heaven. Praise God. So if it hasn't hit you yet, brothers and sisters, spoiler alert, Peter's preaching the gospel here. His message is, the, is Jesus coming down, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, died and rose again so that you and I and all the Jewish men at the time can be saved. That is the message of Peter's sermon here. The Holy Spirit enters in and the church is born. The church is empowered to go out with what they've been equipped. And the, what we see about the early church and what we need to model as Gateway Bible Church is the message that they preach time and time and time again is the gospel. We're not going to get there because we're going to stop after chapter 2, but Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 4 says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. They were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that Jesus is the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number came to 5,000. Later in Acts chapter 5, verse 42, 
remember in chapter 4 they were arrested for preaching the gospel now they've been freed in, in Acts chapter 5 verse 42 and every day in the temple and from house to house they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Christ enter Saul chapter 8 we know that he comes in he approved of Stephen's stoning and then he asked for a list of all the Christians so he can go out and just ravage the church and, and it says that that the church was scattered. They went out. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. That's all the church could do. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, all they could do was go and preach the gospel. And that's all they did. And, and as I was studying for youth group this past week, in, in the Old Testament, historically, everyone came from out of town to Jerusalem to worship. That's why all the Jews are here in this time. Jerusalem was a place to go. And as we see the church is born in Acts, now they leave Jerusalem and the gospel is going out of Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. In chapter 8, it says where they were scattered to, it says, Philip went to the city of Samaria and the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said. So we know he goes to Samaria. And then as we read through the rest of Acts, we see all the different cities. And we know because we have the books in our Bible, the gospel went to Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica. It went to Rome. It went everywhere. It's in the United States now because the apostles were empowered. Gateway Bible Church, my prayer is that every message that I ever bring to you from this pulpit is first saturated and based in the word. I, the, the only way I can think about it is, is when a, a bald eagle or a hawk lands and their claws grip the branch. That's what I think of like my sermon. I want it to just be locked onto the word. I pray that every message I preach comes from the scripture. And if I ever wander from that, please graciously, but please point me back and say, hey, get back on this. But the second thing we see is that Peter preached the gospel. That was his message. And I pray that every message always has roots back to the gospel as well. The final thing I want to I look at in, in Pastor Peter's message this morning is the outcome. So we saw that it was, it was based in scripture. We saw that the message was the gospel. And finally, what is the outcome? Look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? I, I get this sense in their voices of, of desperation and like, what, what do we do? We killed him. We, we killed the Messiah. What do we do? Tell us. And Peter in verse 38, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other wor words he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. <laughs> Look at verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day 3,000 souls. To put it into perspective for you, 3,000 would be to fill the sanctuary at Real Life Church three times over. It seats 1,000 people. It would be like filling up the entire home section of COC on a Friday night. 3,000 people gave their life to the Lord because of Peter preaching the gospel. They were cut to the heart. The gospel is, is a convicting message because it tells people, hey, if you keep doing what you think is right and what you think is good, you're going to hell. You're, you're a sinner who's going to die. And the only way is to change your life, to give it over, to, to give up control and to admit you can't do it on your own. Th this idea of cut to the heart is, is this idea of like a penetrating, deep, convicting. 
It, it was just like the minute they heard this, they felt weak and they everything they had believed was gone. And so they are just this desperation. What do we do? And Peter's response is repent and be baptized. And let me let me throw in why the fact that he says and be baptized is crucial here. Because in Bible times, they didn't do baptisms in a nice warm, heated little pool only for Christians to see. To be baptized in Bible times meant everyone in the town, everyone saw, because you'd go to the river where people were washing their clothes, where Dave would be bringing his horses to drink water, and you're going there and you're publicly declaring to everyone, I am following Jesus. And, and to go and be baptized meant that you were sold out for Christ because it was a public declaration of an inward decision. It meant you might not have a family to come home to that night. It meant you might not have a job. It meant you might be rejected by all of your friends because that's what baptism was. Nowadays, we do baptisms. You can get baptized at church on a Sunday night and go to school on Monday and no one knows what happened because we close them off to the church and this. Back then, they would get saved and their life would be changed and they had to go get baptized. They wanted to show, they wanted to declare this to everyone. And so Peter's saying, all you have to do is repent and be baptized. It was a big ask for them to be baptized. It's saying you need to repent, which we know is to do a 180 turn to change your ways and be baptized. And then verse 41 tells us, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. I wonder how long it took to baptize 3,000 people that day. I, was this a week-long process here? Luke doesn't tell us that, so I'm going to add that to my list of questions asked when I get to heaven. Verse 39 says, For the promise is for you, for your children, and, and just for Jewish people, just for those. No, no. For all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That's the mystery. That is the, prof the, pro uh, the prophecy of Joel chapter 2 that we're living in right now in the church age. The gospel is for everyone. The Holy Spirit, it says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions. Old men shall see dreams. Even on my male and female servants. The gospel is for everyone. And that's what we're living in right now. The fact that we're all together in this room is because of the prophecy that we're actively fulfilling right now. So as we look at Pastor Peter's message this morning, we see it's based in scripture. The message is the gospel, and when the gospel is preached, the outcome is people repent and give their lives to the Lord. The Church of Acts gathered together, prayed together, worshiped together, read the word together. They were filled with the Holy Spirit when the time came. They were ready, they were equipped, and within minutes of the Holy Spirit indwelling them, 3,000 people get saved. The church is born here. That's how it began in Gateway Bible Church. I pray this is how we continue. Jesus passed the baton to them, but the apostles for years and years and years have been passing the baton down. And guess who's holding it right now? It's us. How are we doing in this? How, how is your knowledge of the word? Are you ready to stand up and declare the gospel to people boldly? Would you be able to? Peter didn't study. Peter didn't have a stack of sermon notes. He just stood up, raised his voice, and declared the gospel, and 3,000 people got saved. If you're here this morning and this, this is still confusing to you, Peter says that it's for everyone, that it's for me, it's for you. And, and so if you're, if you're hearing me like, I, I still don't get it, John. Paul later on is going to write in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
we have all, we've all lied, we've all stolen, most of us, guilty, probably sped on our way to church this morning. We've all sinned, we've all broken the law, and, and we've fallen short of God's glory. In Romans 6, 23, Paul says, the wages, what your sin earns you is death. It's eternal separation from God. And, and that's what we deserve. We deserve eternal separation from God because of our sin. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus. And that's what Peter's saying. Jesus came down. He lived. He died on the cross for us, brothers and sisters, so that we can go to heaven. And I just, I, I've told it to the yams. I've told it to the youth group. I want to tell it to you guys. Every single sin, every little white lie we say is a, is a nail in Jesus' hand. He died for our sins but the reason he did it is so that we can be free from our sins. It says, as we studied in Ephesians 2, but God being rich in mercy, he loves us. He willingly came down. It said, we read that he was in control. He came down to die for us. He came down to make a way. And the only way we can get to heaven for eternity is to put our trust and faith. It's to repent, believe, and be baptized. And so if you're here this morning, and it just is not making sense to you, then I would beg of you, give your life to the Lord. Because when you do that, we're promised the Holy Spirit will baptize us and make this all known to us.